Bis denn. Do I have to press a button? Uh, you have the clicker to start the presentation. It's on, try it on. The first is a video. The first thing. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. And for those who are here for the first time, welcome. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce Mr. Jonathan May. Uh, he's uh, the CEO and founder of SponsorCraft. And I'd also like to take the time to introduce Mr. Matt Dobson, who is the co-founder and CEO of EI Technologies. Over to you, gentlemen. Thank you, thank you. So, um, actually the very first thing I just wanted to start with was to show you a little bit about what I was doing before I did SponsorCraft and before I came into Wira um, and before I kind of cut my teeth doing something real. Um, uh, so I just want to show you a video, which is what we made with the last company I was running. Hopefully this will work. Okay, so this is, this is actually the first business that I set up that started to really work. And the reason I set it up, some of you may have already heard, um, is when I was at university, I, I used to play loads of sport. I got injured playing rugby and I was sat there and all I could do was, uh, was, was actually stand in the bar and play table football. 
Um, so that was all I was doing, and that was me on the video. Um, and eventually I discovered there was a tournament scene, and there were, there were people who played more seriously. Uh, and before long I was playing for Great Britain, spending two grand a year traveling all over the world to play. Um, and I thought I should do something real and try and make some money out of it. Um, so having screwed up a whole bunch of about five or six startups um, before this, everything from web technology to, uh, I did some hardware development at one point, I tried to set up a microelectronics company, I'm originally a techie, um, I decided to do something where there was a real product. I could import it from somewhere, I could sell it somewhere. Um, I understood the market, the model, I understood the manufacturers. So I set this business up, we brought the tables in, we ran them in pubs and clubs across the UK. Uh, we set up a retail channel, um, tables were coming from China, um, and it really, it really grew to scale. I mean, we had, we have, I think we still have 250 tables across the UK. So um, that taught me an enormous amount of things about business and also about the fact that the most important thing is for you to understand a bit about your market and really be passionate about the product and the thing that you're selling. If you can't do both of those things, you really haven't got anything to, to sell. Um, I'm now doing something completely different. So in 2011, um, I put together two of my great passions, um, education and, uh, and to be honest, the revolution that we have in finances on the web. So crowdfunding, Kickstarter didn't exist in 2008. Um, now I think Kickstarter's done the best part of three quarters of a billion dollars worth of um, transactions for people. So in the crowdfunding space, this is an absolutely enormous new market. Um, and we really believed in, in bringing this awesome new technology, not just technology, but this awesome new piece of social finance to a sector which is going to be so critical to the 21st century. Um, so really, that's kind of, uh, that's where we started. We started the crowdfunding platform to help students and to help universities to raise money. Um, our model is quite simple. We have an open platform, a platform students can use, and they can use it to raise money for their projects, ideas, events, and the, the universities can also license this platform and use it uh, for, for all of their own projects. Um, and that enables the university to build a community of alumni and the general public who care about their projects, who care about what research is going on, who care about uh, what the students are actually doing. And I don't know about you, but when I left university, I didn't hear from my university for five or ten years. They've just started, started to get in touch and what they're asking me for now is 500 quid or 1,000 quid. They're not telling me where it's going. They're not telling me what it's going to be spent on. They're not telling me uh, which students are involved. And I don't get to talk to those guys about what they're actually doing. Um, so we're basically trying to revolutionize that sector. We're trying to make it more social, more transparent, more efficient. Even if you look at what the sector does today, it's a, it's a $50 billion sector. Every year, $50 billion is given to universities by their alumni, but that's from just 5% of the alumni. So it's an enormous opportunity if we can actually make it more social. So, I mean, I was going to say a little bit about what things went wrong in that process. Um, and some of the biggest mistakes we made and perhaps how to avoid them. One of the, the biggest mistakes we made first was the first university we went to talk to about this. This is before we had a website, before we had anything to show anyone. We went up to a university, um, one of the colleges in Cambridge actually, and said to them, we've got this amazing platform, your students should use it, it'll be great for them, they'll develop entrepreneurial skills, you'll get uh, donors giving back to these projects. And they went, we can't use this because it doesn't have our brand on it. If you give us one with our brand on, we'll pay you for it. And at the time, we decided to disintermediate the universities. We thought we didn't want them involved. We thought we just wanted students to go and run their own things, to connect directly with the alumni. But actually, what we had there was an opportunity. We had a customer who'd stood there and told us what was wrong with our product and our proposition. But we, we felt we knew better than they did how the market worked. And actually, it cost us about a year in the development of the business. Because we didn't go and talk to five or ten more universities. Instead, we kept pushing out to students, and we kept marketing to students. And here's the thing we missed. Without the university on board, you're relying on students' own networks. You're relying on their own passion. You're missing some of the research projects. You're missing the larger building projects. Our first university customer, Southampton University, has 187,000 alumni and they're just developing a new cancer center to help cure various forms of cancer. From that network of alumni, they can genuinely fund million pound plus projects. They couldn't be doing that if it was a student project, and they couldn't be doing that without the university alumni support. So it's really important, listen to your customers. 
Um, and talk to more of them very early on, even before you have a platform, go talk to all of them. We also did, we're quite a tech strong team. I was a, I was a techie at university and um, we built all sorts of random shit. We built features all over the site. We thought that the right thing to do was just keep building stuff um, and tweak the product and fix things. And actually, we had a good enough product after about month two. Um, it was already live, it was already running, and we just needed to get out there and sell more. And if, if all of us had sat there selling more rather than building another 10,000 lines of code, we'd have actually, again, been probably six months further ahead of where we are now. Um, yeah. And uh, I'm just trying to work out. So the, the, the really interesting thing, so our story is, yeah, we did about a year, year with a crowdfunding platform. Then we did about another year re-engineering it so we could license it to universities. And after that, uh, we started looking at how we move around and what we do and what we do next. We applied to, to Wira, uh, which is why we're here. And we also applied to Unlimited at the same time. And the combination of applying to Wira and Unlimited and questioning and thinking about what our big value proposition was and what we actually believe is going to make a difference uh, was actually what brought the, the company together and enabled us to actually succeed uh, and actually progress as, as a company. Um, so we, we got the team united on a common vision. Um, which was all about the actual social impact of what we're doing and whose lives it changes and how it makes a difference. Um, and I mean, some of that's been coming through, uh, through, through the program we've done with Unlimited. Um, so if you don't know what Unlimited is, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a effectively a charity. It is funded by the uh, Big Lottery Fund to help deliver social impact through enterprise uh, in the UK. Creating a company without a social purpose is probably pointless in the long run. Because in the 21st century, we don't live in a world with like unbounded resources. You can't just keep consuming and you can't just keep building things that will take up more of people's time, energy, resources. So actually going through the program and being questioned about why we were doing what we were doing, what difference and what impact it actually made to people's lives, enabled us to actually put together a value proposition that worked both for the business, for the business's stakeholders, but more importantly for the customers. Because when you're going to pitch to a university, if you can tell them how you're going to change their lives, and how you're going to change their students' lives, and how you're going to change the staff's lives and the alumni's lives, you actually have a story, and you have a product, and you have something people actually want to build, uh, actually want to use, actually want to buy. Some of the key differences that you have if you use our product at the, at the university. Well, at the moment, when they fundraise, they call people up on the phone or they'll send you a letter. Now, imagine if instead of having an office of five people at the university ringing around thousands of alumni trying to get them to give money, you had all 15,000 students at the university creating projects on a platform, talking about things they care about and are passionate about with goals of money they're trying to raise, and deadlines, and targets, and rewards, and things they give back. Every single one of those students is an ambassador for the institution. They're people who care about their projects, and they're people who want to push them out to the wider community. They're actually running micro-businesses themselves. Every single one of those projects is like a small startup. If you look at Kickstarter, you'll see every single one of those projects is basically a startup. So you're embedding an entrepreneurial mindset in the student, in every student, even if the projects themselves never go on to be big businesses, or never even go on to be small businesses. They're entrepreneurial projects, so you're teaching skills that will actually change those students' lives. And moreover, by embedding the mindset of philanthropy in the students, when they leave, they're very likely to start thinking about giving back. Those are students that will have directly benefited from a gift by a former student, somebody who used to be a student themselves. So when those people leave, not only are they already on that platform, they're actually used to the model of philanthropy. So coming back to the numbers I gave you at the start, if 5% of the world's alumni can give $50 billion a year, what happens if we engage 50% in the process? So I think actually really, um, I haven't, I was going to give myself another three minutes actually, but that's, that's really the message. I actually think the most important thing that you can do with your business, um, and pretty much the only important thing you can do with your business is to figure out what problem it's really solving in the world. Because if you solve a real problem, then the rest just fits into place. There will always be money for a real problem, for a real social problem. So if you cause change, everything, everything else is easy. So I'm going to leave it there and hand over to Matt to talk about EI. We're going to take some questions at the end, I think. So.
Thanks, Jonathan. We should uh, play later. I've yeah, never played you. It's a, I'm, sure, I'm sure we whipped my ass. So. Good afternoon. My name is Matt Dobson. I am co-founder and CEO of EI Technologies. Um, so on the Gutenberg stage this week, there's been a number of segments about different parts of how to start a business. So you've looked at people, you've looked at investors, you've looked at people, you've looked at uh, markets. What I'll try to do in my uh, talk this afternoon is link all that together and say how it applied uh, to EI technology. So how we started just a year ago now and through to where we are now uh, with about 150, 175,000 pounds worth of investment uh, and also in the wire scheme as well. Okay. Um, so we are a hard, what's called a hard tech startup. So fundamentally we do technical stuff. We build uh, speech analysis for smartphones. So we look at detecting emotions in voice in real time on a smartphone. So already, you know, tailor what you, see, what you hear from me this afternoon with, you know, this is a technology startup. This is not a uh, consumer startup. There's various different models. Okay. So a bit, ba bit of a background of me and how we got this started with, with the whole trends here. So I used to work for Philips Electronics. So Philips Electronics build everything from, um, you know, uh, what they're called, Philips shaves, light bulbs, uh, hospital cat scanners as well, the whole lot. I was brought into Philips to look at their technology, find new opportunities which would come to market in three, five, eight years' time and look to build businesses, new businesses of things and categories which didn't exist within Philips and bring those online and create them into business units. The area I was particularly interested in is the whole idea of what's the, the consumerization of healthcare or health 2.0. So people looking after their own health, people looking after their own health and well-being. And why is this happening? So there's a big trend in the world. So this is, this is where the groundswell comes from. We're talking about big changes in numbers, big changes in behaviours. We were focusing on the fact that people in the Western hemisphere, you know, in the Western nations, the developed countries, there was changes going on within the healthcare system. So in the States, it's becoming extremely expensive. So people are spending more of their own private money on treating their own healthcare and also doing preventative healthcare. People in, in countries with uh, state healthcare, like the UK, they're realizing there's restrictions, limitations on what the government will give you. So people are having to spend their own disposable income in managing their healthcare. And then you've got developing countries like China and India where you've got this whole middle class swelling up who have disposable income and they don't have a health system there from the state so they're having to spend their own money. And people are realising actually it's not me spending money when I'm ill that counts, it's me spending money on keeping me from being ill which counts, that's where I'm going to spend my money. And that's where our focus was within Philips, looking at um, this new segment, this new trend in the market, uh, this whole groundswell. Um, I'm bringing this through. And you can see companies now that are coming through. So you've got people like Fitbit, for example. Uh, you've got people like Body Media. These are in the same sort of space, which are very small uh, startups who've all started in this space. So these were the trends coming through, driving this forward. Um, I left Philips at that point. Um, but I came away with this idea, this insight from this trend in the market and saying, actually, this is something which will work. You know, this is a big trend. It's investment hot. There's a lot of interest in this area, a lot of investment moving into this area. It's an area I know really well. Okay. So I'm going to have a go and start a venture in this uh, of my own. Um, and then it was asking people. So getting into contact with people that I knew that could validate what I wanted to do. So I first opened a magazine a couple of, a couple of months after leaving Philips and read in there some technology that was um, some smart technology for analyzing voice on a smartphone. I thought, actually, that's kind of cool. That's better than the stuff we were doing before. It's on a smartphone. It's a mass market appeal. So I knew that you know, this is mass market appeal for a mass market trend. There's got to be a fit here. I, I went into my networks. I, I phoned a few people up literally and said, look, this is my idea. It wasn't a product. It wasn't a market. What do you think? Is it going to work? Is this investable? Is this investor hot? And they gave me the confidence to take those a stage further to develop some ideas, to go out and talk to potential customers, to talk to potential investors saying, you know, would, if I did something in this area, is this investable? What would it take to be investable? So getting feedback from your potential customers, your potential investors of what would work and what wouldn't work. And there came a point at which I said, okay, right, this is go. I know how to do this. No, I, I kind of have an idea. I know how to make it investable. I know how to get money out of people. I know where to sell it. 
and then it was my first hire really, getting my co-founder on board. So Duncan Barkley, who's our CTO, I've known him for a number of years. He, he's worked with me previously on some other sort of tech I was doing with him, Philips. And literally, I phoned him up and said, look, I've had this cool idea. I think it's a goer. Let's have a chat about it. So we sat down July last year, and I went through the idea. And he went, fine, that seems a goer. And then literally, that's the first person, the most important person you have on board, the first person who actually believes that it's going to work, because then you're not mad. Then you've got some sort of validation. So he started to fill in the technical domain. I then had a good conversation with my uh, other colleague, um, uh, Professor Mike Katz. So Mike Katz is one of the guys behind the invention of the uh, clear blue pregnancy test. So he's got a long history of innovation in the healthcare market. So he was my domain experience guy to give me the credibility of, you know, if I can convince Mike Katz this is a goer, actually investors will believe me now. And so getting Mike on board and say, look, Mike, this is what I'm going to do. We've explored these ideas before. Here's some technology. Is this going to work? I've got this technology guy on board. And that was it. Once he said, yes, OK, we can, we can believe we can do this, then we can move forward to the next point at that stage. Okay? And don't forget, the people in your team are who investors put their money behind. So you need to have, as we said up here, this, this idea of why Combinator. That really is true. I had the business experience, I'd done it before. I had some of the domain experience. Duncan brought in some of the technical experience and some of the business experience. And Mike brought in a whole cross gamut, mainly of the domain experience, but some of the technical experience and a lot of the business experience as well. But when you've got that, you've got a shape of a company which is believable to be investable in at that point. The next one we looked at is market. So you're taking a trend which is grounds full of change to actually market, so markets which actually consume things. Um, so we were quite lucky here. For a hard tech venture, we, had, we were quite unique in actually having come up the, with the market idea, the product first, and then the technology second. So we actually came to this point of knowing what the market was. Um, but we looked at the market, and the market was healthcare. And it was, a good, it was a good opportunity. It was a big opportunity, but it wasn't massive. And what we figured out through conversations with investors, because we were look, ours was a speech technology, we actually could be a much bigger market. Uh, and overnight, EI technology has changed from a healthcare market into a speech recognition platform. Okay? So there you're moving from a tech product to a tech platform. And platforms are much more, uh, much more valuable longer term than individual products are. But unfortunately, that complicates things because instead of you having to sell a product, uh, an offering, a service to an investor, to a customer, you now have to sell a platform. And platform, you lose some of the focus you have on a product. But, but uh, platform equals massive, product equals fairly big. So you have to do that change. That was a real struggle, and we still struggle with that now, selling to investors, especially the difference between angels and VCs, because angels, angels tend to invest in products. They want things that they can ship and sell and get money on. VCs invest in platforms. They want the big play. They want the massive opportunity. And as a, as a startup, it's how you flex between being a product and how you're being um, a, a venture platform uh, proposition, as well, which, is a, which is difficult to do. We still haven't got right, but it's working on it. It's the story that you tell going through this. And the final part is the product. Okay? So here, we kind of knew the market. The market was health. The, the specific market we were looking at, we had to identify an area within that where our technology would be superior to everyone else's technology and also the status quo within that market. And it had to solve pain. It can't be just a nice to have to make someone feel a bit better. It actually had to cure them almost. It had to be 10 times better, 10 times faster. It also had to be a product which fits in with something that already exists. It's very difficult, I wouldn't say impossible, but very difficult to bring something to market which nobody has an equivalent to buy now because people have to learn a new behavior. And that's really difficult. It's much better to substitute one thing for a better thing and your thing, rather than have them learn a new behavior. Um, so we had to find all this in, in, a, in a niche market. So the only name I'll mention today is Go uh, Jeffrey Moore. So Jeffrey Moore had this absolute right, absolutely right in his book where he's talking about this innovator, this niche market to get these things going. You've got to find your niche markets to get, uh, to get your early adopters, to get your product for, forward through these revenues. And, and our niche market's in mental health, so in depression and anxiety. 
uh, patients there don't understand fundamentally what makes them happy, what makes them sad. Okay, so our app, which recognizes emotions in voice, is a way of people understanding their emotions, what their triggers are for during the day. And it fits very nicely in what they're asked to do already by their therapists. So there you can substitute one product in, our product, over the top of an existing product, which is uh, completely inferior. And therefore, you're not really asking the person to change their behavior much, yet the benefit at the end of it is, is absolutely great. Plus, it's paid for by their physician, not by the person themselves. And so there you've got a di different dimension there between who's paying. So the benefit comes to the, the patient, but the actual payer, and the economic benefit comes to the physician and also the person who's paying the medical expenses. So if the government or the private medical insurance as a provider as well. And the final bit then is how does it all fit together? So this, is, this is all started to come together, I suppose, in, um, in February this year, where we had a team on board, we had people filling the main places we needed. We had identified a market and a story to go around that market and products which, which fit in a storyline and we had the roadmap that going on forward. The bit then we were stuck was actually we need the money to get going. As a, as a hard tech startup, it's very difficult to bootstrap these things. It is possible, but um, you do require, and this is why I put the hockey stick up there, you do require some upfront investment to get going. Now, the in initial investment in our case actually came from ourselves, so the three founders, myself, Duncan, and Mike. We all put some money in because we needed to get a technology specialist on board to give us, the, um, give us some technical assistance to get to our demonstration because we needed a demo to convince investors to give us more money because talking to investors, what they wanted to see is actually a product, a demonstration product. And so it's about agreeing the milestones and then building towards those milestones. So that initial investment allowed us to do the initial development, to do the demonstration. We then, with that demonstration, we managed to convince the Technology Strategy Board, which is a governmental grant organization, to give us uh, a grant worth £100,000. When we had the TSB grant on board, we convinced WIRA to put in the match funding. So now WIRA, when they invested in us, then they were able to leverage against a government grant and make their money go further. So now it all starts to come together and make sense for investors. Um, so now we're at a point where after working on this properly as a company for just over uh, 13, 14 months now, we're in a stage now where we've raised £150,000. We're still looking for a bit, about £50,000 now to move us on to the next stage. We've uh, got together our team, we've got together our market, we've got together our product, and we've got together our finances as well. And we've got that story which all fits together in a coherent way that links all together, put all these parts together. Okay, thank you very much. Jonathan, would you like to join me back on stage? Uh, cool. Any so, questions, ladies and gentlemen, to put to the uh, wonderful host? There you go. Right. I'll okay. just say thank you very much, gentlemen, and it was an insightful talk. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you.